This presentation is kind of an interesting one. It's called software archaeology, which is the more politically correct term, I suppose, for, for reverse engineering in some ways. Um, and what this presentation is about is um, basically something that I have done for many years as part of my day job working for doing consultancy and customer support. So um, what I end up doing is I go on to uh, client sites and start looking at their applications. And based on doing analysis of the way their application runs, I can often have an intelligent conversation about what the application does, what it's supposed to do, and what the architecture is. So this presentation is really um, some of the process flow of going through that to, to work out how an application actually works. And often you'll find that how an application actually works and how the people that own it and designed it think it works don't match. And when they don't match, you often have some kind of defect or architectural problem, or performance problem that you can fix. So being an IBM presentation, the first thing you get is a whole list of disclaimers. And these are just saying that you know, if the presentation is about products, product direction can change. Uh, there's no commitment we'll deliver a feature that we talk about in the presentation. But um, there's nothing in here that's trying to sell you a product. Uh, it's more about the method and the process and what you get out the other end. Um, the examples I use happen to be um, IBM tools and I run with an IBM JDK, uh, but there are equivalents in other places and basically everything I use is free anyway. So myself, um, I've been working um, as part of the, the IBM Java team for 12 years now. It becomes 13 years on October 20th. Um, and I spent most of that time working on client engagements, doing customer support and consultancy. Um, I now do uh, what we call consumability, but it, which is really usability, monitoring, diagnostics, um, that kind of work as well. And I've also got some work that, um, if you saw uh, the keynote session on Sunday from Jason McGee, where he talked about Java in the cloud and patterns, um, I also now do um, our integration for, for that, for, for base Java runtimes. Um, so, so basically, as I said, this presentation has come out of spending a number of years looking at other people's applications, trying to work out what it does, and then having a conversation with the architects and the owners of that application about you know, whether it's supposed to do what it actually does. So the goals of the talk are to uh, introduce software archaeology and talk about the, the software life cycle and how we close the software life cycle so it becomes a circle. Uh, we'll discuss some of the methodologies, so a couple of ways that you can do it through static analysis or runtime analysis. And hopefully by the end of it, we'll have shown you how to uh, understand what your application actually does and reconcile an architecture that you, diagram that you may have with what it actually does. And if you don't have architecture diagrams, how to kind of generate them from, from an application that you do have. So we'll for, first talk about the software lifecycle. Then we'll talk about software archaeology itself. Um, we'll do an introduction to UML. Um, I'm not a UML guy. I only use UML as a fairly standard way of drawing some diagrams. I could just as well as you pen and paper. I could use you know, flow diagrams from Visio or you know, wh whatever. UML is just, just handy. And I'm sure the way I use UML is probably not right. But you know, it, it's usually to help me visualize something and be able to communicate it to other people. And the last third of this or so is to actual, actually dig into a, a couple of applications. One of them is a very, very simple application that's only a couple of classes. Uh, the other one we'll take a look at is, is actually Tomcat. So first of all, the software lifecycle. So this is what it's supposed to look like um, according to Wikipedia. Uh, so it should be a, a continuous circular development process where you start off with your requirements. You know, this, the, the business requirements for the system that you're about to build. And from the requirements, you generate a design, and you have what should hopefully be a clean architecture. And then you take your architecture and you start to implement it. So as we all know, when someone comes up with an architecture and you start to actually write the code, there's a very good chance that it's not going to end up the way it was designed. Right? We, you hit roadblocks. You, Frankly, for, for reasons of having to get it out the door, you cut corners. 
and you do things differently because the way it was envisaged at the start isn't as practical as you thought. And you know, agile is supposed to teach this. This is where you do things continuously because things evolve over time. So you've been through requirements, you've been through your design, you started implementing, you then start testing that system, and as you test it, you find defects and those lead to changes. And then you have this evolution that happens as a result, and it may go into to maintenance, and you'll get further changes as defects occur. But you should go back to your requirements. Because every code change you make should have a requirement. Whether that's a defect, whether that's a request for enhancement, whether it's a change in the business requirement on the system, really there should be some form of requirement for every code change you make. And as I said, that could just be a defect in a bug tracker. But from that, you should update your design and go back to the implementation. So it should be a continuous circle that means that your design and your implementation are actually in sync. So, so that's what it should be. Um, the best that usually happens is the waterfall model, where you do start off at requirements, you go through to design, you go through to implementation, you do testing to verify that model, it goes into maintenance, you keep making changes, and what you end up on the right-hand side no longer reflects your requirements in the slightest. Um, and that's usually what happens. So, as the changes get made at each and every stage of the, the waterfall model, where you just end up being more and more divorced from your requirements in your original design when you've got your system running in production. And it gets worse with, uh, with legacy systems and legacy code, because the truth of the matter is, you may not have the requirements, and you may not have the original design. All you've got is the implementation, and that implementation may have been changed in the field anyway. So what you end up running with for, for legacy systems can often look nothing like um, a, a design if you have it. Now, the problem with legacy systems is that usually they're there because they do a job. So you've got to keep them. And as long as you don't have to change them, that's fine. Um, but th let's face it, um, if you're using any vendor software, that vendor software eventually goes out of support. And that means you have to move. You, you, you get given no choice. And some technologies do go away, right? There's not many people doing work in Fortran anymore. So if you had an application that was written in Fortran and you want to move to a new language, you kind of need to understand why it was written the way that it was written and what it actually does. Now, some of those requirements, hopefully you've got written down or you have business requirements, but if you don't have any form of that, then a starting point is what the old system did and how it worked. Now, obviously that's not the best way because often the requirements got changed when it went to implementation. So the existing implementation probably isn't exactly what you want to do, but it's a good starting point. So for legacy systems, there could be no design um, at all and maybe no requirements. So software archaeology is basically the study of poorly documented or undocumented legacy code and software imp implementations. So it's how to take something you've got and go back and basically reverse that life cycle so you get back to where you should hopefully have started from. So the point of software archaeology is to make it possible to, to effectively build designs, get understanding for, for legacy code and for legacy systems, or it applies equally to things which you know, kind of broke the life cycle model when the work was done. So when we talk about getting your design back from your running code, the, the standard way um, these days of, or sh should be, I suppose, of, of doing designs is, is UML, the Unified, Mod um, unified Modeling Language. So UML started in the early 90s or so. I think it was around 94 or 96. And the whole idea of UML is to have a standardized model for looking at different levels of your architecture. And you know, um, architects have blueprints. Um, software developers have, have UML models. And UML is basically broken into two categories of diagram. You have one which is behavioral. And this is kind of how things flow through the system. Uh, so it's the dynamic behavior, and at the use case level, it's kind of like, you know, I want to interact with the system in order to be able to find out how much money I have in the bank. And it's that kind of flow system. And structural diagrams are the physical layout of things. So it could be a deployment diagram that shows you what servers you've got, where they sit inside the network, what your DMZ is, and so on. So behavioral diagrams. 
Um, if we go through them one by one, uh, starting at the highest level, really, the highest level is your use case diagram. And these are kind of the visualization of the requirements of your system. So this shows the relationship between uh, the actors, the e external influence on the system, and the system itself. So actors can be human beings, but they can be other systems. And this shows you basically the relationship between your, your users and the building butt blocks of the system. So in this case, it's a, a banal example with a, a band manager and you've got um, a record manager and how they interact with things like how they're doing in the top 40. Uh, the next level down is an activity diagram. So an activity diagram basically goes down one extra layer and starts looking at how there is flow between um, slightly lower level of com um, components. Um, it's you know, basically just one level down. It's, it's more in depth than, um, than a use case diagram and tells you how things move through the system, but it's not the kind of level that we're used to as software developers. Right? It, it doesn't get modeled at the level of classes and the interaction between classes and objects. That really is um, even a stage further after state chart. So state chart is, as you go through, um, as you go through the parts of the activity, how does state change? Um, and how does interacting with this object in order to change something uh, affect your state? Then the level below that, which is what we're probably more used to, is the sequence diagram. So the sequence diagram really does get, tend to get down to the level of these are my objects and this is how one object interacts with the other one, which is effectively a method call. So it shows you the call graph of methods, where starting from one object moving to another by calling a method on it, and then that may call another object by calling a method on it, and this is how your objects interact. Now, you can actually do a sequence diagram in the same way at a much higher level and talk about how organizations talk to each other. But the usual one is to do a, a sequence diagram where uh, classes interact with each other and objects interact with each other by making method calls. On the structural side, again, if we start at the highest level, you've got your deployment diagram. And deployment diagrams are generally used uh, to represent your physical topology. So what machines you've got, um, what applications are on each of the machines, how they connect to each other, what firewall you've got in place, and so on, right? where, where your storage is, this kind of thing. Below structural diagrams, you have component diagrams. Now these could be represented at the level of services. So here what we've got is uh, we've got a billboard service and we've got a reporting tool. So it's kind of that high level application building blocks. Whether they're inside one process or the separate processes is, is the level which you pitch it. But it's the interaction between, um, between components. And then we get down to the level that as developers we're probably more useful, used to, which is class diagrams. So class diagrams are individual classes of code usually. Um, it will define the fields that you have. So whether you have static or instant fields inside your object will be defined here. Uh, it often adds in what methods are defined in each class, what the inheritance is between classes and interfaces, and what the references between classes are in terms of, you know, my object instance of this class references another class, so you, you have those dependencies. And you also have object diagrams, and the difference between an object diagram and a class diagram is that an object diagram is basically um, a snapshot in time of your system. So it's a class diagram at a, a given point in time. So with object diagrams, you can often start to add in values. So you can say at this point in time, the int stored in this object is four. Okay, so those are the kinds of diagrams that we might want to build. And basically for, for software engineers at, at the developer level, you're really looking at uh, sequence diagrams. So how objects and how classes that you've written interact with each other. And class and object diagrams. So how the classes are physically laid out, what the inheritance is, what object references there are from one class or one object to another. So if, if that's the kind of information that we want to, to build, how can we do that from, from our application? So the first way of doing that is static analysis, right? There are tools out there where you can load your source code into the tool, and it will start generating UML for you automatically. 
Um, there are some limitations here. Most of the tools will do class diagrams for you, but they won't do sequence diagrams. So they won't do the flow between objects. And the other problem with static analysis is you need to have the source code. So if you have an implementation that you are running, you've got a legacy system that you've had for 15 years, you can't build it anymore, it's in a foreign language that you don't know, and uh, you don't have access to the source anymore, then the static tools won't do you any good. Also, if you have, um, you know, if you're running an application server, and you've got your web application, or you've got your J2E EJB application, and you want to see how it's interacting with, with the third-party vendor code, with the application server, or with things like the Spring Framework, again, static analysis won't do that for you because you don't have access to the source code. So it won't show you what that's doing. You can only see the code that you've got. So static analysis works, but there's some limitations. Uh, the next one is trace-based analysis. So you can put trace points into your code and see what it's doing. Um, there are tools out there that use either aspects at compile time to put it into your source code, or bytecode injection, so at runtime it puts trace points in, and it uses that to try and find out what the flow is through your code, what objects you're allocating, how they relate to each other, and so on. Um, now, that works fairly well, but it's expensive. So the fact that you're continuously tracing is an expensive activity. So if you've got a test system that is representative of what you do in production, then you know, that's an option for you. Um, but if you've only got a production system, that's the only way you can exercise the system. Trace can be expensive. And the third option of using a debugger uh, is even more expensive, where you're going to step through code. Basically, you can't run that on a production system. You can run it you know, in development only. So, so those are the various options. And I'm actually going to go through um, showing a way of doing static analysis and a way of doing um, a trace-based analysis for, for each of the steps. So first of all, we'll have our sample application. And this is a very, very simple application that's just a bad Java implementation of grep. So it's called Java grep, and all it's going to do is take a term and a, a list of files, and it will search those files for that term and print out, um, print out any instances that it finds. So the usage is Java grep, the pattern that you want to search for, and one or more files that you want to search through. Uh, the implementation of Java grep is here. So um, in terms of what it does, in the main method, it uh, compiles a regular expression, which is the pattern that you passed on the command line. And it takes the list of files that you added, and you adds it to an array list called file list. Then for each of the files that you've passed to it, it will create a file scanner. And against that file scanner, which you've passed the file name and the regular expression to, it calls scan. Um, it then queries the file scanner object to ask it for the number of match lines that's, that it's found. And if it's found a number of them, it prints those out. And then it prints out a summary. So it says, you know, we found five lines out of 200 that matched, and here's what they were. So all Java grep does is takes your regular expression, compiles it, adds the files to a file list. For each of those files, it creates a file scanner object, calls scan on it, and then gets the results. So most of the work's done in the file scanner. And what file scanner does is to first uh, create a line number reader for the file that you've passed to it. So it creates a file stream, creates a line number reader for that file stream, and so on. Um, then for each of the lines in the, um, that the uh, line number reader brings back, it calls get line, so just file reader um, dot read line, checks for any matches by doing a regular expression uh, check, and if it finds them, it adds it to an array list called match lines. And that's it. And it's got some getters and setters. So the first of those is the implementation of scanline itself. And scanline just calls pattern.matcher.findmatches. And then we've got the getters for the, uh, for the get match lines, which our Java grep class calls. Um, the scanned line count, so we can call get line count to find out how many lines that there were. And we can get the number of match count. So it's very, very simple two classes. So in order to find out what the dynamic behavior was, 
effectively what we're looking for is the method cool graph. We're looking for how one object, when we start, and we're going to be starting with the main method, from the main method, what's the next method that's called? What does that call? When it returns, what's the next method from that class and so on? So you're basically going to be building a tree of calls and what that looks like. And that basically equates to a UML sequence diagram. So in the example here, if this was your main method, it's we call main, then we see that this is going to be creating a file scanner, then it's going to be uh, calling scan and those sorts of things. Right? That's what we're expecting to come out the other end. So when we try this and we want to generate a sequence diagram, I so said there's two mechanisms that I'm going to talk about. One of them is static analysis. So the, one of the problems with trying a static analysis is that from what I'm aware, there aren't too many tools out there that do good sequence diagrams out of static analysis. In fact, most of them don't even try. Um, there's actually a, um, in the exhibition center upstairs, there's a, a company there that does a UML modeling tool. And they do a great um, class diagrams. Uh, they don't do sequence diagrams. Um, IBM's got its own product that, that does static analysis um, called Rational Software Architect. It does great class diagrams. For sequence diagrams, it does one method only. Um, and you can try and patch work them together, but you know, basically the tools aren't there for sequence diagrams today. Um, so really, if you wanted to do static analysis, you do it manually. Right? You get a UML modeling tool, you start trying to create a sequence diagram, and you walk through the code by hand, and it's a slow, painstaking task, especially when you don't really know which bit that you might care about. So your other option is to do runtime analysis. So you can turn on tracing, you can run the application, hopefully you've got a test case that actually you know, hits most of the code paths. So you need to do that when you're doing you know, code coverage testing, when you're doing QA or performance testing maybe, or if you've only got a production system, you want to be able to do it in production, which means your tracing overhead has to be really low. So doing it via static analysis, um, where we've got access to just the Java grep class and the file scanner class, it's possible to get a diagram that's actually pretty good. Um, it's slow, as I said, you, you're kind of doing it manually. Um, and it is limited to just Java grep and file scanner, but that's OK, because we don't really care what's going on around that. Um, but it does work. Um, now, it, it is possible to include other calls. I could, you know, I create a, a file reader. So I could include the call to the file reader. But if the file reader does something else, I, I don't know about that. I can't do that from my manual analysis. So if you wanted to do runtime analysis, um, there's a couple of good tools out there for doing this. Right? IBM's got one called uh, Health Center. And it does uh, full cool graph analysis for virtually no performance cost. And it gets away with doing this because it uses the just-in-time compiler to generate the, this information. So it, got, it has a full cool, cool graph of every method and what it calls. And uh, uh, Oracle's got an equivalent in mission control. So there are a couple of tools out there which will do this. So we have pretty much platform coverage. But what this will do is it tells us that we have at the top of Java main method, uh, sorry, Java grep main, that calls our file scanner. Um, we've got file scanner .scan. It gives you the, the full cool graph of absolutely everything that happens. So, so this is great. We, we've got you know, the, the starting framework of being able to, to build our diagram. And if we, so hopefully this is much easier to see. If we dig into particularly file scanner .scan, it can show us that file scanner .scan calls scan line. It calls the line number reader .read line. It um, creates a string buffer and does an append to it. It creates an array list and does an array list dot add. So we've got all of that information. And in fact, we can go stupidly far down um, the cool graph if we want to. We can see that scan line uh, creates a matcher. Um, it find, tries to call find on the matcher. What the implementation of the regex matcher in uh, Java does is it calls search. It creates a uh, pattern start. It calls match against it. So you've got absolutely every bit of Java code that's running in the system. So you can go um, you know, from your code into container code out to JDBC drivers. You can build the full picture if you want to. Now, one of the things you might notice when you look at the output on the right-hand side, though, is it's not ordered. So you'll notice that. Um, 
in some cases, we do initialization, according to the hierarchy here, after we've used the object. And it's because this tool doesn't actually know about the order in which methods have been called. They just know that they have been called. And the ordering is actually done according to where most of the CPU time is spent. So most of the CPU time inside file scanner is spent calling scan line. In fact, that's what the 43.5% is. So most of the CPU time inside scan is calling scan line. So the tool's designed to do performance analysis, but it does give us this call graph. So you've got two options at this point. You can say, well, logically, I can look at this, and I know initialization has to happen first. And I know that I have to find a line before I can scan a line. Right? So you can apply some, some common sense to it. But you can also um, decide to where are we? Yeah, you can decide to uh, drill into bits that you care about and turn on tracing and find out the order of the calls using tracing. So uh, again, this is just some inbuilt tracing that's in the IBM JDK. You add some command line options and it starts tracing method flows. Um, but this tells us that inside um, the file scanner, uh, it calls scan, it calls get match lines, it gets called get match count. Then it calls get match count again, it calls it twice. Um, and it calls get line count. So we now have the complete call graph of everything that's being run, and we've got some ordering information. Uh, um, so between the two, we can now build a sequence diagram that basically goes as far through the application as you, you care to go and has correct ordering information, and if we're calling the same method twice for whatever reason, we have that. So a combination of uh, a low overhead sampling profiler that gives you the full call tree, plus the ability to drill into the bits that you care about using method tracing, um, gives you the ability to basically build a good sequence diagram for, for any application. So, the other side of this is um, structural diagrams. And we said that the best structural diagram for what we care about really is a class diagram. So class diagrams give you the inheritance between classes and the references between implementations of those classes, so, so objects. So again, um, I said there's lots of tools out there that will do static analysis, and they're actually pretty good at this. So if you've got the source code, you can run static analysis, you can get UML class diagrams out of it. If you don't have the code, or you want to be able to see how your code interacts with third-party code and so on, you can do runtime analysis, and that means, again, you run your application, and you generate a system or a heat dump. Um, this works on all platforms. If you're using Hotspot, you get an HPROF format dump. On the IBM platforms, there's something called a, well, you can get a, an OS level system dump, or you can get a PhD format heap dump, and that's all the data that you need in order to be able to build class diagrams from runtime. So if you did the static analysis approach, what you get out is, uh, in our case, you've got the Java grep um, object, and you've got the, the file scanner object. So it tells you the fields which exist in, in either and you get the methods and you get the fact that one uses the other. So you've, you've got the information. If you wanted to do this from runtime analysis, and once you've taken a system dump or a heap dump and you've loaded it into the tools, um, what you get initially looks a little complex. So what I've done here is I've just searched for the Java grep class. And what you've got in the panel on the right hand side is every single reference from the Java grep class to anything else in memory. So lots of that stuff is things that's in the class itself. So when you've written the class and you've put some strings of text in there, there's a reference to those strings. But the interesting stuff for us is at the bottom here. So it tells us that we have a reference to a match string, and that match string contains four. It tells us we have a file list, which is a, an array list. It tells us we have an underscore pattern field, which is an implementation of regex.pattern. Um, it tells us that it contains four and it's been compiled. Um, and if we care about inheritance, where we care about does this class extend another class or implement in the interfaces, you get that in the top left-hand corner. So we can see Java grep here doesn't extend anything. It's, it's blank. It's just an instance of, of Java Lang class. And you get a summary of your, your statics. 
So anything you've declared as being static inside of the class on the left-hand side, if you cared about things that were instance fields instead, so not declared as static, just fields that you're using, they would come under the attributes heading. So from a system dump, I can go and search for Java grep, and it basically tells me that we had a match string, its value is four, we've got a file list, which is a Java util array list, it's got one entry, and that's dot dot source Java grep. So I'm basically grepping myself for instances of for loops. And it tells me that there's a pattern, and that pattern is the compiled version of four. So it's just doing a, an anywhere in the line search for, for the string that I gave it. So you take a system dump, and it basically tells you exactly what your application is doing, what's being used in memory, and the interaction between them. So that's the Java grep class. So the next thing is the um, is we can actually drill into anything, right? We can drill into code that you own or anybody else's code. So if we wanted to look at the file list, which is our array list of files that we passed in that we wanted it to search, from the file list, which we have here, we can see everything that it references. We can see it's got instance fields. One is element data, which is an array of objects. It's got an int called size, and it has an int called mod count, whatever that is. So it tells us it's size one, and that there's an array of objects. So we can go into our element data, and we can actually see what's in that object array. We've got its size, we've got its count. We can also go into file scanner, and inside the file scanner, we can see from what it references in the list of attributes on the left-hand side that it's got a file name, it's got an F reader, which is our line number reader, it's got um, a string called underscore pattern, which is our, uh, our, um, which is our um, for that we passed in, changed into a regular expression, and then compiled. We've got match lines, which is an array list of the lines which we found were matched. We can then drill into that array list if we want to see what lines have been matched by the application at this point in time. We know that there's 41 um, lines that were scanned, and we know that there were four that matched. So the system dump gives us this full relationship between every single object on the Java heap and the values inside every single field, whether it's a static field on a class or whether it's an instance field on an object. So you can use that to generate your UML. Um, so what we would expect is that it looks exactly the same. And it does bar one thing. The only thing you don't get by this route is the list of methods, which I said you could optionally add to each of your classes. But we do know what the methods are, because we've got that from our sequence diagram. And if you wanted to, you could run Java P, uh, the Java probe, against, uh, which ships as part of the, the Java runtime. Um, you can run that against the class. You can get the list of methods if you wanted to anyway. So, a system dump will give you the full architectural layout, the full class diagram uh, for, your, for your application, and a mix of profiling and tracing will give you the sequence diagram. So that was a pretty simple application. It was only two classes, and we had the source code for it. But I can do the same thing for, for anything, and um, what we've got here is trying to do it against uh, Tomcat. So what this is running is against uh, Apache Tomcat 7027. So this was run probably a couple of months ago when, when that was the most current release. Um, and again, the approach for, for doing it through the, the, the cool graph method profiling is to start off by searching for your main method. So when we search for our main method, we find that that main method is org.apache.catalina.startup.bootstrap.main. And what bootstrap.main does is it effectively calls init load and start. Um, but it delegates those through to um, a second instance. So it does, uh, it uses reflection to try and find a class which is the org.apache.catalina.startup.catalina class. And then it calls init load and start on those. So we now know a little bit about the way that Tomcat does its startup. Right? It has a bootstrap class and it effectively calls load class and then invoke on um, a Catalina object. So we could then get our system dump and start to go in and say, OK, so given that it calls the Catalina object, um, the object and that calls it um, init, load, and start methods, what does the Catalina 
object itself look like? What data does it store and what does it reference? So what we can see here is we have a Catalina object and it contains a fair amount of data. It's got a reference to a config file. So that's just a string, but it's conf-server.xml. So we know that it loads its configuration from, uh, from a server.xml file in the conf directory. Um, we know that it has a child object called server, uh, which is an instance of standard server. Um, we know that it's got inside the server, we have an address called localhost, so we know that this application is running on localhost. Uh, we know it's got an mbean server, and we can probably go into the mbean server and see what mbeans are available and what values that they're currently making available over the network. So, you know, if it's being used to provide some monitoring, we can go in and we can see the current state of the monitoring when the dump was taken. Um, what else might we want to know? Um, we know that there's a state object. So that state object probably tells us something about the state of the Tomcat server at this point. So it might tell us it's initializing, it might tell us it's running, it might tell us it's stopped. Um, we know that there's a shutdown object, um, and we know there's a shutdown hook. So we can see that it does some kind of processing when it shuts down. So this is starting to tell us quite a bit about how Tomcat starts up, how it's configured, and what it does. So we can then start digging into that server object and go a little bit deeper. So inside the server object, we said that there was a, a state object. And that state object might tell us a little bit about what the, the application's doing at the moment. So there is a state object, um, and it has a value in there called name, which is set to started. So, okay, at the point that this dump was taken, our Tomcat server was started and running. Um, we can also see that it obviously does some processing work around um, that lifecycle state, because we have uh, a lifecycle support object with a number of listeners registered. So we've got a number of lifecycle listeners. So our application cares about changes in state, has a number of listeners for those changes in state, and they're going to do something when that happens. So we now know who those listeners are. So we've got um, a lifecycle listener, a Jasper listener, uh, a leak prevention listener. So we can then start drilling into those to see what, they, what their current state is, and we can then go back to the profiling view of all of the, um, the method calls to see, okay, so we've got a leak prevention listener. And I can see, look at its data to see what its current state is and what calculations it looks like it does. And then I can go to the method call graph to find out what the flow is and what methods it calls. And this probably will give us a good idea about what kind of leak that it's looking for and roughly how it goes about doing it. So this is how you can start go moving backwards towards, I've got an application. It does stuff. I need to know what it does. So between the two tools, between using call graph analysis and having your object graph, your, your object diagram, you start to get a good idea of what your application does. And whether you choose to create UML from this, you know, standard notation, or whether you choose to you know, just use it for your own understanding, you know, either's fine, but the data is there to allow you to do this. So in summary, um, it's possible to do static analysis and find out what your application does and how it runs. Uh, there's also runtime tooling out there. You know, I was using some stuff that's built into the IBM JDK that's free. Mission Control for Hotspot does a lot of this as well. There are third-party tools which will inject trace and allow you to, to look at the, the flow of um, your application by, by that mechanism. Um, but you know, it's all there, and it will let you find out exactly how your application runs over time. Um, that's good for closing the development lifecycle yourself. Um, it's always interesting um, talking to system administrators um, and people that look after production systems and showing them these tools, and then them talking back to um, their architecture team and saying, so why does it work this way? Why does it do this? And then you start to see some debate where the, the architects are saying, it doesn't do that. And you start to reconcile the two, and you realize that there's a fundamental problem. And you know, at some point between design and implementation, things went awry. And the system no longer does what it was actually designed to do. 
So you've got that ability to close the loop. You've got that ability to talk and to, to actually work out whether the system's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and that helps if you ever wanted to migrate your system um, and you had to migrate that system and you want to know what state is actually in now, how your application actually works. And this whole thing really is very useful for helping to debug problems. As I said, I spent you know, probably 10 years working with customers by doing this kind of analysis to work out what the application does to then start having that conversation about why certain design choices were made, why it was chosen that you know, it's implemented in this particular way. And often the answer that you, come, you get back is, that's not what we designed. It's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to work differently. So it's often pointing out that you know, a mistake was made. Um, there's some references there. The tools that I use are, are all linked there. Um, the, the cool graph processing is a tool called Health Center. Um, the memory analysis stuff is a tool called Memory Analyzer. Uh, it works on all platforms. There's an Eclipse version of it. There's an IBM port of it, which builds in some information about IBM products. Uh, but it's all freely available. Um, there's a, a blog that we run, and there's some discussion forums and the like and the uh, obligatory IBM trademark and copyrights on the end. So we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, so is there anything anybody wants to, to ask? So the, the tool that I use to get the call graph automatically is Health Center. And, and what it does is um, basically, the just-in-time compiler um, from both IBM and Oracle are uh, tracing compilers. So what they do is they watch the way that code flows in order to make the right decision about how to compile it. So it generates this data anyway. And what Health Center does and Mission Control from, from Oracle is it allows you to visualize that data that's already been generated. So it gives you the call graphs, and the, the cost in terms of performance is less than 1% because it's just sending data over wire that's, that's already been generated. So, so those really are the two tools, either Health Center from IBM or Mission Control from, from Oracle. Yes? So, so, so you're right. So, so the first part, you could decompile code in order to get source and work off that. Um, there are often legal aspects that says that you're not allowed to decompile code. So, you know, um, I work for IBM. I'm not. I, as I said at the beginning, the software archaeology is the, the pleasant term for reverse engineering. Right? I'm not allowed to talk about reverse engineering. Um, I'm pretty sure this is being recorded, which means I'm probably in trouble for that. Uh, but you know, the, the clean side of this is you can do it with profiling. Um, now, in terms of from the byte code or from the reserve, reverse engineered code, generating the cool graphs from that, um, as I said, from what I've seen, there's not much in the way of good tooling out there. Um, and, and that's kind of the problem. Uh, if there was, then being able to do it statically would be really useful. Um, the, only, the only difference is um, that if you can do it from a running system, you actually get to see which bits of the code really get used versus those bits of the code which happen to be there and may never get invoked at all. Yes? So um, yes, a system dump is a, a snapshot in a point in time. Now, um, regardless of whether garbage collection kicks in, what the tool shows you is all of the live data. So it's the full structure of your application. It, it removes the garbage for you. 
Um, the, the limitation from doing it at runtime is, is the same that it is for static um, analysis for, sorry, for runtime analysis for cool graphs, which is you'll only get to see the bits of the application which are being used. So if you've got ancillary bits um, which you know, we haven't used that function yet, we've got an MDB that's not loaded because that message format has not arrived, then yes, it's missing. It's, it's a limitation of the approach. Um, but again, the other side of that is you actually get to work out which bits are used and which bits aren't. So it's, it's a trade-off. Yes? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it, it's true that if people have obfuscated their code, so the, you know, they've mechanically uh, modified method names and field names, then life gets a lot harder. Um, and you, it's not impossible to, to, to generate a good understanding of what's going on, it's just significantly harder. Um, and in all honesty, uh, I think people should know that security by obfuscation and security by uh, obscurity doesn't work long term. So yeah, I mean, you should write code that people can understand in the first place. But that's just my uh, opinion. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is there any tooling that, ha that works at the, the higher level? So you know, we, we said that there was deployment diagrams, component diagrams, and I was looking at class diagrams. At the higher level, um, there may be. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, in all honesty. I, I think it's fair to say that from the work that I do going on to, to talk to, to different clients, they generally have a better understanding of what happens at the higher level because there's less information and people can eat more easily hold it in their heads. It's when you start to go down to the level of, well, this was developed by a team of 150 people. You know, no one has a clue how it actually works anymore. Um, you know, people work in their silos and they only understand their little bits. So there probably is tooling that will track um, trans uh, transactions and interactions across processes. I, I know, again, uh, there's an IBM tool called um, ITCAM Real-Time um, Tracker, I think it is, which does exactly that. It does correlation ID passing between processes and it follows you know, like web service transactions and so on. Um, that's a commercial tool. I don't know um, what, what other alternatives there are. Um, I want to uh, tell you there's a British tool. <laughs> I should look it up, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> so how do you find the time to let a... a <laughs> so it's surprising how quickly you can start generating the data. It's, Unfortunately, there isn't much automation tool that sits on top of it at the moment. So once you've got the data, you do sit down and you spend two or three days manually working out how everything works. But in terms of the call graph data, you can gather that at less than 1% overhead on the application. You can gather it in production and take the file and just look at it offline. And the same for, for system dumps. System dumps are more expensive. It's a one-off cost. Um, and it does depend on how much memory you're dumping. So if your, um, we actually do performance analysis with this. If your application is three gigabytes in size, it takes about 40 seconds to write a dump. Uh, but you only do it once, and it does so non-destructively. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you miss your SLAs um, for a short period of time to gather a huge amount of data. 
Yeah. So, so the question is, um, for, for the call graph analysis, what do you do if there's the likes of an if-else block? Um, so the, the basic method profiling will tell you uh, if there is two method calls from the parent, which one's called more often? Right? It, it does a CPU breakdown. Uh, it, it won't tell you, you know, this is inside the if and this is the else. Uh, if you want that kind of information, then your only option is to drill down into that particular method with some kind of tracing. So it, it, the, the advantage of the, the method profiling at the, the high level is that you get everything very, very cheaply. You then have to drill in if you really want to know specifics about specific methods. Anything else? Okay, then thanks for attending, any, everyone. Um, if you want to see more of some of the tools I've got, like live data on my system at the moment, I can show you if you really want to. Thanks.